My name is Sean Summers. I'm the assistant pastor at Crossroads Christian Fellowship, and it's my pleasure to bring you the call to worship from my backyard right here at my house. We may not be able to meet together in person, but we can still connect virtually. We have such great tools available to us. So I'm gonna be in Colossians chapter two. If you wanna open up a Bible and follow along, I'd encourage that. Otherwise you can follow me as I read. So starting off right in verse one of Colossians chapter two, it says, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. To me, that's an awesome message for where we are right now. It's so pertinent to the experiences that we're going through, where we may be absent in body from one another, but we're connected by something greater than anything else. And that is the Spirit of God. Sure, we can't gather together as a church in the sanctuary, but we can gather together in God's Spirit and be church we can be church wherever we are. And that's the important message that I've been sharing over the past couple weeks. I think Paul gets to the heart of that here. See, I worship God because of the technology that we have that we can share in this experience together. We can connect via YouTube or wherever, Facebook, Instagram. We have so many ways that we can connect. But also, as we connect, we embody that idea of being a community, of supporting one another of being church the way that God wants us to be, even in a time like this. And as we become the church that God has called us to be, that in itself is an act of worship. So I'm gonna pray. Wherever you are listening to this, I encourage you to pray along with me. Pray for the things that we've been experiencing. Pray for you to be able to embody this idea of encouraging one another, of being together, united in spirit, and pray for the future of the church over the next few weeks as we navigate these really tough circumstances, but really great opportunities to meet people where they are, to spread the gospel, and to bring hope to a world that doesn't have a lot of it right now. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you that you are greater than all of our circumstances. You are greater than all of our hurts, all of our temptations, all of our struggles. You are greater than the situation that we're enduring right now. And your love compels us to be in community with one another, to encourage one another, to be the church in our own contexts, in our spheres of influence, to those around us. So I pray that you would open our eyes Provide us the wisdom through your spirit that we need to be the church wherever we are, whether that's just to our families, whether that's to our neighbors, wherever we are, I pray that we can worship you and we can be the church the way that you've designed us to be the church. And in your name, your powerful name, above all names, we pray, amen. Thank you. Hey church family, thanks for joining in with us. I hope wherever you are, if you're at home or in your living rooms or uh, alone or with your family, that you're ready to worship the Lord with us this morning. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Hannah Trevor, the director of music for Crossroads. And uh, let's, let's worship this morning. Let's raise it up this morning that he is faithful and he is good.
let's take this time to welcome the Holy Spirit into our into our homes, wherever you are right now. Uh, Jesus, we invite you into our living rooms, into our kitchens, our home offices. Uh, no matter who is with us right now, God, we know that you are here with us in spirit, God, and uh, just help unite us as a body together, as, as brothers and sisters, as believers in you and your word and your will. God, help us to uh, feel close to each other, Lord, and, and we pray that your spirit would draw in near to us this morning. God, we welcome your spirit here.
morning, everybody. My name is Anna Beyer, and I am the pastoral intern responsible for children's ministries here at Crossroads Christian Fellowship. We're so glad that you could join us this morning for our first ever virtual service. This is our time of offering, and we invite you to join us in this time by either text message, going online to our website, or mailing a check directly to the church. And you can find all the details for how to do that below this video. Additionally, if you have any prayer requests that you would like to submit for your staff to be praying for you, we would love that. And we hope that you do by emailing us at office at crossroadsjourney.com. I'm just going to pray for us really quickly. God, I thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the ways that you're moving and the ways that you're growing people and strengthening our faith, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we, your people, would be lights to the world, God, that we would bring the encouragement and the generosity and the kindness that you've instilled in, in us, God, forward, that people would see you, God, and be unable to deny your presence, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing and thank you for what you will do, God. We know you are good and faithful and we praise you for that, Lord. I pray all these things for your glory and not our own. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the lead pastor here at Crossroads. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you're having a great morning so far. I hope that uh, the worship has touched you, and I hope that you feel like God is with you in the place where you're at. This is an interesting situation for us. This is the first uh, digitally recorded, uh, I guess, video recorded service that we've ever done. So it's a little different. Obviously, the situations that we're living in right now are a little different. But thank you so much for joining us. I want to invite you right after the service, we are going to have a live uh, Q&A time uh, on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page, where you can join us. You can share your prayer requests. You can ask any questions you might have about this passage of scripture, uh, the times that we're living in, or what's going on at the church. We'd love to see you there right after the service. Uh, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Would you join me in prayer as we enter into God's word? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for what you have done for us, Father, across the ages. Not just in our own lives and the things that we see and we remember, Father, but the cross that's behind me. What you did. What it means that your son came to live for us and to die for us. What it means that he gave his life for us, the object of your affection. Thank you for what that tells us about who we are. Thank you for the promise that it gives us as to our future, no matter what happens in the here and now. Father, as we open your word, help us to be people who are rooted in what you've said and who you are and what you've done. Help us be people who live in those truths. And because of that, Father, draw other people near to you. Lord, bless this time as we open your word. We ask these things for your glory and in Jesus' name, amen. So you would think that preaching to nobody would be easier than preaching to people. Uh, and I thought that myself. Uh, actually, I was definitely mistaken. It's so funny. Um, I had a hard time. I tried to do this standing up and just do it the same way that I would do if, uh, if a church was in the room with me. And uh, I, I just couldn't do it. I don't know what it is. You're thinking about the cameras. You're thinking about all kinds of stuff. And it just is, I, I couldn't be myself. So I'm just going to sit down and tell you what's on my heart. But I did find an audience so I could feel like I'm preaching to someone. Let me show you that real quick, just right over here. These are interesting times, right? Unprecedented for most of us. Uh, most of us have never lived through something like this, where the government's telling us, stay in your homes, uh, don't go out. Uh, I know people are worried about their finances. People are worried about uh, what's going to happen with their jobs. People are going to worry about 
you know, the stock market and what does that mean for my 401k and all kinds of things like this. And all those things are valid. I was trying to think if there was a situation like this in the scriptures that we could relate to. And I found this story that I want to share with us this morning. I want to invite you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Here's the setting for this story while you turn there, and I'll also put it up on your screen, I think. We'll see how that works out. Uh, there's a king, and he's being besieged by another king. The problem for the first king, Jehoshaphat, is that he's outmatched by the other kingdom that's coming against him. In fact, the other kingdom is holding them in siege. Now, this is really interesting. This is a story just like ours. Jehoshaphat and all of the kingdom of Judah is and Jerusalem um, is holed up in Jerusalem inside the city walls. They can't go anywhere. They're running out of food. Uh, they don't know what they're going to do because their army is no match for the army that's on the outside of the wall. There are times that we find ourselves in life where we just don't know what to do. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. What do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> I think the Bible is going to inform us. And so I want to uh, invite you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Uh, I'm going to start here in verse 5. Let me read this to you. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Let's just stop right there real quick. He says, are you not? That's a question. Are you not the God in heaven? We're not the first ones to find ourselves in a situation where we have to remind ourselves of who God is or we find ourselves questioning who God is. Ah, uh, aren't you the God who said you'd take care of this? Aren't you the God who loves me? Are, are you the God who's all powerful over everything? We're not the first ones to find ourselves in a situation where we're kind of wondering who God is and what that should mean to us in our life and our context and what should we should make of the madness that's going on around us and threatening to press in uh, on our lives. He says, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms and of the nations. Power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? You ever find yourself wondering, uh, didn't you put me here? Aren't you the one that brought me here? Aren't you the one that led me to these circumstances and situations? Jehoshaphat finds himself in the same situation. God, aren't you our God? Are you this kind of God? Didn't you do this stuff for us? Because it doesn't seem like it sometimes. It doesn't maybe seem like it right now. Maybe you find yourself in a similar situation where you're like, God, I just don't know what to make of what you've done in my life before because here's the situation I'm in now. Where the challenge and the crisis that's outside of your life is pressing in so much that is causing you to doubt or wonder or forget who God is and what he's done. That's where Jehoshaphat's at. And so he goes on with this prayer. They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. But here now are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by, uh, by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Now catch what he says, because this is really important. He's in the same situation that you and I find ourselves in now with this uh, virus. He says, we have no power to face this vast army 
that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But our eyes are on you. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, we can follow Jehoshaphat's model. I don't know if this is the situation or if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you're just at your wit's end, where you are paralyzed um, with worry or fear or anxiety. I remember this one time, Elizabeth and I in San Diego, we used to go camping um, and we'd like, we'd call it poor people camping. I had a truck and we'd just drive up into the mountain somewhere and we'd make a little bed in the back bed of the truck. It didn't even have a camper over it or whatever. And we'd just sleep out under the stars at night there. Uh, but we'd drive out in the middle of nowhere to do that. Well, one time we were out in the middle of nowhere and uh, we're laying in the truck and we had just eaten dinner and we're laying down and we're getting ready to go to sleep and uh, all of a sudden we heard some noises outside of the truck. And we're like, huh, that's weird. And then we heard a noise that sounded like uh, it wasn't just something scooting around in the bush, but it sounded like, you know, people noises, like metal uh, clanging on something or whatever like that. And I told Elizabeth, I said, get in the truck. And she didn't even move. And she said, no. And I said, get in the truck. And she said, I can't. And she was paralyzed with fear. I was scared too. Uh, it, I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you're just like stuck and you just, you, you don't know what you logically should know what the right thing to do is, but you, your body or your mind or your heart just won't agree with you. Uh, Jehoshaphat finds himself in this position. He says, we don't know what to do. We have no power to face this vast army. Well, he does some right things, though, and we can follow his example. Number one, he cries out to the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. I don't know why we forget that sometimes. I don't know if it's because uh, we feel like not all of our prayers get answered or we've had prayers that didn't get answered or we're just consumed by worry and fear, but we forget to cry out to the Lord. He does that. He goes to God and he cries out to the Lord. And he's already made this agreement with God. He says, hey, listen, uh, at least the people of Israel have. He says, if calamity comes upon us, whatever it is, we'll come here, we'll cry out to you in our distress. And we know that you will hear us and you will save us. Wow, that's, that's powerful. We know that you will hear us and you will save us. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, number one, you cry out to the Lord. He took a situation in which he was overwhelmed in which he didn't know what to do. And he took it to the one person who he knew would know what to do and be able to do it. He took it to God. You know, the funny thing about that is that sometimes it's not that we forget to cry out we just forget to cry out to whom? Meaning this, we cry out a fair amount. Um, we cry out on social media. Uh, we cry out to our friends and neighbors. But this scripture is telling us, don't just cry out, cry out to the Lord. Well, what's the difference you say? Well, one, that God is the person sitting above all this. God is the one who can do something about it. That's who we need to go to. We shouldn't confuse crying out to the Lord with simply crying out. Crying out to the Lord is not complaining. Jehoshaphat brought his situation to the Lord. He was honest. He said, look, we're outmatched. We're outgunned. Uh, we don't know what to do. He was honest about where he was at and how he felt. In other passages of scripture, you see him doing very symbolic things like tearing his clothes and these kind of things. So he was distressed the way you and I right now might find ourselves distressed. But he didn't just cry out. He cried out to the Lord. That's important. When we cry out to the Lord, it's not simply complaining, which sometimes that's what we're given when we find ourselves in situations we don't like, we don't understand, or that press in on our fear or anxiety. We just start to complain that's not good for us. It's not good for the people around us. The, another difference between crying out to the Lord and just crying out is that crying out to the Lord is not about spreading our fear and anxiety. 
crying out sometimes does that. When we cry out to the Lord, we take our issues and our problems to God. We don't spread them to our neighbors. Hey, I'm scared about this. I'm anxious about this. I'm fearful about this. Here's this headline that I read. We don't spread our fear and our anxiety. In fact, we attack it differently. We say, God, I'm taking it to you. I'm giving it to you. You do something with it because we know God is not scared. Your fear and your anxiety is not going to fuel his. Our friends and our neighbors, that's a little bit different. We want to be careful that when we cry out to the Lord, that we're not just crying out. And we want to be careful not to just cry out and forget to cry out to the Lord. The Bible tells us this. It tells us to uh, take our prayers. Do not be anxious or worry about anything, but in prayer and supplication to bring our requests to God. And the peace that transcends all understanding will guard our hearts. We need that right now. So many of us need the peace that transcends all understanding. When we go into a store and we see empty shelves, when we open the refrigerator and we see empty shelves, when we're getting laid off from our job or we don't know how long we'll be working on our job because of everything that's going on, we're worried, we're anxious. God says, bring that to me and I'm gonna give you something. I'm gonna give you peace. Listen, you can't have peace that transcends all understanding if you don't have circumstances that make it unreasonable for you to be at peace in. These are tough times or different situations for sure. But your God is bigger than them. He's overcome. Jesus says, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. God is still on the throne and we need to remember that as we cry out to the Lord. Number two, we fix our eyes on Jesus. The scriptures tell us, let us fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, so often, if we were to ask our, this question, uh, our eyes are fixed on just different things. So for instance, if I were to ask you, what are your eyes fixed on? You might say the social media feeds, uh, the TV headlines, the news headlines, uh, uh, the constant running toll of how many people are infected and how many people have died and what it means. The Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus. Yep, there's going to be trouble in this world. There's going to be things that happen. But God says, man, if you want to get through it, you focus your eyes on Jesus because he has overcome the world. These things have no power over him and no control over him. And in that, no control over us. Jesus himself says something that is crazy to us. He says, uh, do not worry about those who can kill the body and then do no more. Well, what else is there? But well, Jesus says, oh, there is more. There is more. I died to give you more. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Jehoshaphat says to God, our eyes are on you. Take a minute. If I were to look at you, if I was in that living room with you and I said, what are your eyes fixed on? What would your answer be? This is a great time for some of us to refocus for some of us to move our perspective from here to here. To say, God, my eyes are fixed on you. It's no surprise that when our eyes are fixed on the things that feed our fear and our worry and our anxiety, that those things are going to grow. What Jesus is telling us is, fix your eyes on me and I will grow your faith and your hope, and your peace. What are your eyes fixed on? The third thing that Jehoshaphat did that you and I can do is he waited. And maybe we'd say it this way, wait patiently. We cry out to the Lord, we fix our eyes on God, and we wait patiently. We're so used to everything happening like right now. In fact, Elizabeth and I, we have this different thing. Elizabeth likes to go to restaurants where she can sit down and order. I'm very impatient. I hate to go to restaurants where we have to sit down and order. I should say that differently. I don't hate to go to restaurants where we can sit down and order. I just, it's not my preference and I really generally don't like it. I'd rather go somewhere where I can tell them what I want. They hand me my food, I eat it, and then I go. 
that's where I'm happy at. And you know, I think I'm probably more impatient than most people are, but our whole culture is kind of like that. We want things now and we worry when we don't get them now. When we cry out to God and we go, okay, God, I prayed. Nope, no answer. And immediately our worry and our fear and our anxiety kind of take over and we just dive right into them. We just kind of surrender to those things. Jehoshaphat makes a prayer and then he has to wait to see what happens. In result of his prayer, he gets a prophecy where the prophet says, hey, you know what? God's gonna take care of this. Don't worry about it. But you know what? They had to wait. They had, it didn't happen immediately. They had to wait to see what was going to happen next. They had to wait to see if that prophecy was going to come true. The Bible tells us over and over again to wait on the Lord. In one passage of scripture, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Stop running around. Stop being crazy. Stop whatever and realize I'm God. Plenty of passages of scripture, plenty of scriptures tell us, Wait patiently on the Lord. Others tell us, I waited patiently and he delivered me. Well, the time has come for us to wait patiently. We call out to the Lord, we fix our eyes on Jesus, and then we wait patiently. And you say, man, what am I supposed to do? In fact, that's the problem. I've got too much time that I'm waiting and because I'm not doing anything, my fear and my anxiety, they're eating me up. Well, here's something practical you can do as you wait on the Lord. Remember, remember, remember what God has already done. You could take that time to go through the scriptures and read them and look at different Bible plans and read things that God has done throughout history uh, as his people were waiting for him, as his people were waiting for deliverance from their own personal issues or even larger things than that. You could dive into your own life and remember the things that have happened, the prayers that you have prayed where God has answered those prayers, where God has shown up, where God has said, I'm here for you. You could remember the signs and wonders he gave you to let you know that he was real, that he's with you, that he loves you. All of us have those stories. In fact, at my church, I have this thing where I tell people, they'll tell me something that happens and I'll say, write it down. At some point, we need those things. We need to be able to pull them out, to look at them and say, yep, that's right. We need to be able to go back over our Facebook posts or our Instagram posts and say, I remember when that happened. I remember when I prayed for that. And I remember how God showed up. One of the things that we do to bolster our hope as we're waiting in the Lord is we remember. We remember what God has already done throughout history and our own lives and the lives of our church family. We're not the first ones to run into a situation in which we don't know what to do, in which the circumstances are bigger than we are. I wanna encourage you to follow Jehoshaphat's model. Take your fears, your worries, your anxieties. Cry out to the Lord. Fix your eyes on him. Some of us, we need to, we need to change our perspective. I know that we need to be informed but we also need to fix our eyes on God. He's the one that's going to bring us peace. We need to wait patiently for God. Not everything happens in a moment. God, the Bible tells us, he's always working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We don't always understand that. We can't always see it. Sometimes we don't agree. But that's what it tells us about God, and we need to wait patiently to see that. What do we do while we're waiting? We remember. We remember what God has done throughout history. We remember what that cross means. We remember what he's done in our lives. We remember what he's done in other people's lives that we've prayed for. This is a great time while we can't meet in church to be sharing testimonies with each other. I remember when God did this for me. I remember when God did that for me. To be emailing each other instead of our worries and our fears and what are you gonna do and how's this gonna work? Emailing and texting and sending each other videos of our stories, our testimonies, what God has done. Let's bolster ourselves and each other in our hope and faith. God has made you a light to the world. These are somewhat dark times for us. God says, you're a light to the world and I've set you up a city on a hill. Shine and shine brightly. Your hope and your faith will help you to shine. Jehovah's model will help us to grow in our hope and our faith. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, 
we want to confess to you that sometimes we struggle. We don't know, Father, um, what to do in situations. The, the circumstances seem too big for us, and we just don't see a way out. We don't see a cure. Father, we want to tell you right now, in faith, we know your arm is never too short to save. You love us. There's nothing we could do to make you love us anymore, and that's outstanding, extraordinary to us. Bless us as we cry out to you. Bless us as we fix our eyes on you. Bless us, Father, as we wait patiently to see your deliverance. And call to our remembrance, Father, the things that you've done in history, in our own lives, Father, our own testimonies, and in the lives of the people that you've surrounded us with in our church, in the lives of the people that we've prayed for, Father, and we've seen your deliverance in their lives. Remind us of those things, Father. Lord, we ask these things for your glory, and in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thanks so much for joining us. I want to invite you to the live Q&A session. You can have some prayer requests or you can share your prayer requests. You can, maybe some people will share some short testimonies with us. You can ask questions about uh, this service, uh, this sermon, uh, the passage of scripture, what's going on in the world, what's going on in your church, any of those kind of things. You can join us on our Facebook page or on our Instagram page and we'll be there for a live Q&A. Thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you're having a great day. We are praying for you. Please be praying for us. Be praying for the world around us. That's the most powerful thing we can do. Other than that, let's spread some hope and faith. God bless you guys, and thank you for joining us.